Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ba'du. Uh, Insha'Allah ta'ala we continue uh, with the series on the branches of Iman known in Arabic as Shu'ab al-Iman uh, We began this book last session Alhamdulillah we began the book last session Before we begin uh, on the fifth uh, branch of Iman Let's do a little bit of review Insha'Allah We have anybody has memorized the hadith? Anybody has memorized the hadith? In Arabic or English? Arabic or English? The, the main hadith with this whole series revolves around which is that Iman is continue, continue, continue. Anybody want to take a, a try at it, Dawood? Want to take a try? Anybody else? Iman is how many branches? 60 something or 70 something. The highest is? All right, saying La ilaha illallah. The lowest? Removing something harmful from the road and or so something then says something is from the branches of Iman. Well Haya, which is modesty. Alright, modesty and shyness is from uh, Iman. Alright, we also mentioned that there's uh, Iman is uh, we have specific definition which is referring to the beliefs, right, of your heart. But we said that the Iman has a more more what much more general meaning. Anybody remember that general meaning of Iman? Three things it involves. Three things which covers and 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 this meaning of Iman, it's going to be a synonym of Islam, which is what? Anybody remember? Speech, beliefs, speech, action. Did you remember those three things, right? Beliefs, speech, action. Iman is uh, belief, tasdiqun bil janan, as they say in Arabic. Wa qawlun bil lisan, wa amalun bil jawarihi wal arkan. Three things. Just remember those three words. Belief, speech, actions. And so when, when we go through the book, we're going to see that uh, there are, it's not only beliefs that are mentioned here. Right? Because Rasulullah Sallam says in the hadith that uh, part of Iman is Imatul Adha an tariq removing something harmful from the road. That's an action. Right? That's not a belief. But Iman is much more comprehensive than just beliefs in the general meaning. Beliefs, speech, actions. All right? So remember those three things. Uh, then we covered uh, the first four uh, pillars of Iman. The first four pillars of Iman, which is belief in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, belief in uh, the Messengers, belief in the angels, and belief in the books. There is one verse in the Quran. If you know this verse, then it covers all of those four that we just mentioned. And I think most of us are familiar with this verse. It's in the last part of Surah Al-Baqarah. Who knows that verse? Yes. Good. You want to complete the verse? Say it. Amin al Rasulu. Mm hmm. Good. So those four things, that's what we mentioned in the, in the previous session. All right. Those four things are what we mentioned. So if you memorize that verse, remember that part of, part of that verse, and we've all, I think, um, are familiar with this verse, then, then you know the, the, uh, you have the evidence for the first four uh, branches of Iman. All right, we're going to start, inshallah, with the uh, fifth branch of Iman. The fifth branch of Iman, Al Imanu Bil Qadri, Khairihi wa Sharrihi min Allahi Azza wa Jal, Li Qawdi Ta'ala, Kul Kulun min Indillah. Due to the verse where Allah says, Everything, say all things are from Allah. All things are from Allah. What is Qadr? Very simply put, Qadr is to believe that everything happens by Allah's knowledge and will. Everything happens by Allah's knowledge and will. Everything in the past, present, and future has happened or is happening or will happen by Allah's knowledge and His will. Nothing happens without Allah's knowledge and nothing happens without His will. And this is what the verse is saying. All things are from Allah. And then he brings, uh, the author brings a hadith, hadith which is in the Sahihain, that Adam السلام, and Musa السلام, once disputed. Adam and Musa السلام, once disputed. How are Adam and Musa disputing? Adam is the first person Right, the first human being created. Musa came thousands of years later. Right, thousands of years later. How are they disputing and having an argument or having a discussion when they are thousands of years apart? Anyone? How are they having a discussion when they are thousands of years apart? 
the, the answer is, really, we don't know, right? We don't know, but the same way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all the prophets together in the uh, Isra and Mi'raj journey, right? We know that when he went to Jerusalem, he met with all the prophets, all the thousands, hundreds and thousands of prophets, and he led them in salah. And these prophets had long passed away, left a worldly life. How did that happen? Allah made it happen. All right, so somewhere in the life of the grave. Now, the life of the grave is a bit different. All right, the life of the grave, people are interacting in ways that we don't know. So in some way or form or the other, Adam salam and Musa, they, uh, they met together and they had a discussion or you could say argument or dispute uh, about this issue of Al-Qadr. So Musa salam was blaming Adam. He said, Musa said, Oh Adam, you are our father, but you let us down and expelled us from the Jannah. So we know that uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, he created him and he lived where? Where did he live? In Jannah. We said to Adam, uh, you and your wife, you live in paradise. You live in Jannah. So they were in Jannah and they were told, you know, do whatever you want. But don't go near this tree. And we know that Allah, uh, that Adam alayhi salam, he gave into the temptation and he uh, made a mistake and he disobeyed Allah فَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى and he uh, ate from that tree and as a result Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told him and his progeny قُلْ نَهْبِطُوا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا we said to them go down to the earth you and all your progeny go down to the earth so uh, Musa is blaming Adam he's saying to Adam you are the one who made us go down to earth you made us go and fall down to earth we should have been in paradise we should have been in Jannah but because of you, we were expelled from Jannah. So Adam alayhi salam replied, he said, Oh Musa, Allah, look at Adam's response. He's very uh, polite, right? He didn't just go right away and, uh, and refute him or re respond to him. He first praised him. Oh, uh, oh Musa, Allah chose you to receive his words. Uh, and he wrote the Torah for you with his own hand. And then he gave his response. Do you blame me for something which Allah had destined for me 40 years before he created me? So he's using this, this term, uh, this, this uh, belief of Qadr, that Allah has willed everything. And this term Qadr, by the way, uh, they translate with different terms. They, some people call it divine decree. Some people might call it pre preordainment or predestination. All right, ordainment. There are different terms for it. We go, we'll use the term divine decree, which is that everything has happened by the will uh, and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Adam alayhi salam is using this. He's blaming or he's using Qadr as the reason for this. All right, so are you blaming me for something which Allah destined for me 40 years before he created me? Before 40 years. Uh, it comes in the hadith that the first thing Allah created was what? Anyone? The first thing Allah created. Before that. Before, first thing Allah created. First creation. Anyone? The pen. All right, so Allah created the pen first. And then he told the pen to write. And then the pen said, what should I write? And then Allah said, write the destiny of everything that's going to happen from now until the end, the end of the world. So everything was written already. So Adam alayhi salam is referring to this, that uh, everything was already written. So how are you blaming me for something that was already preordained 40 years before I was even created? And then Allah says, or Rasulullah says, therefore Adam alayhi salam prevailed over Musa. He won the argument. Uh, now important question. Important question. Can we blame Allah's divine decree on our sins and mistakes? Can we blame Allah's divine decree on our sins and our mistakes? In other words, somebody commits a crime or somebody does something wrong, can they blame Allah's qadr? If somebody comes and they punch you in the face, they come up and punch you in the face, and then you ask them, why did you do that? They say it was Allah's qadr. Allah will for, me for this to happen. Is that acceptable? All right, or parents, your, your child comes home with a bad grade from school. And then you ask them, what happened? Why did you get a bad grade? And they say, it was Allah's will. It was qadr of Allah that I got this grade. Is that acceptable? It's not acceptable. So why does it seem that Adam salam is blaming qadr on his mistake? Anyone? Think about it for a second. And if anyone can get an answer. It's a very, it's, it might be a very uh, tough uh, question. Well, why does it seem that Adam is blaming Allah or blaming the Qadr of Allah on the mistake that he made? And then, and then Rasulullah SAW says at the end of this hadith that Adam prevailed over Musa. He won the debate. He won the discussion. 
So why does it seem that well, we can't do that? If, if we were to allow people to use Qadr as an excuse for mistakes and sins, then people would do whatever they want and we would have no accountability. Right? A, a man came to Umar radiallahu anh, and he had stolen something. So Umar was going to apply the, the punishment of theft. And the man said, how are you going to punish me when Allah will for this to happen? It was the decree of Allah that I stole. So Umar Raswani said, and it is the decree of Allah that we're going to punish you and cut your hand off. So he, Umar said, no, we're not, you, you can't use that as an excuse. So why does this mean that Adam is blaming Qadr on his mistake? Huh? Yeah. Mm, not quite. Not quite. Anyone? It's a bit tough. It is a bit tough. Okay, but that's not what he's referring to now. <clears throat> now this, this, is, this issue in Arabic, they call it Al-Ihtijaj bil Qadr, which is like uh, blaming Qadr. When can you blame Qadr, when, when you cannot. And the scholars have mentioned that when it comes to sins and mistakes, you cannot use Qadr as an excuse. But when it comes to calamities, right, calamities, trials, tribulations, then you can use Qadr. So if somebody, uh, a, a, a family member died, right, or some calamity happens, an earthquake, we can use Qadr, we can say, this was the decree of Allah, that this happened, be patient. All right, so when it comes to calamities, we can use Qadr as, uh, as a, uh, to blame Qadr or use it as the reason for things happening. But we cannot use it for sins and mistakes. So if you look back at this hadith, Adam is not using Qadr to justify his mistake. He's using Qadr to justify or to give the reason of the calamity, which is human beings being brought down to earth. Right? So he's not, he's not saying, I, uh, I ate from the tree because of Allah's Qadr. He's saying we were sent down to the earth because of Allah's Qadr. So he's not using Qadr to blame his mistake. He didn't, bring his, he didn't say anything about his mistake. He's talking about the fact that human beings were put down on earth because of that mistake. And Musa alayhi salam is blaming him, not because he ate from the tree. He's saying to him, you caused us to come down to earth. You caused this calamity on us that we had to come down to earth. So Adam is saying, you cannot blame me for a calamity that happened because Allah destined this calamity. All right? So we understand that he's not using Qadr to justify his mistake. He already, uh, he already owned up to his mistake and he repented, right? And they repented, both of them. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِلَّا مْتَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَّا لَمْنَا خَاسِرِينَ That's the dua that Adam and his wife, uh, they both made. All right? So Adam a.s. is not justifying his sin or his mistake. Rather, he is using Qadr to explain the calamity of human beings coming down to earth. This is something Allah willed already. It was, it was destined and it was willed that, Allah, that human beings would come down to earth. And we were not meant to be in Jannah from the beginning. Whether he ate from the tree or not, even if he didn't eat from the tree, this is something that was already going to happen. Right? One way or the other, Allah was going to send down Adam and his wife down to earth and their progeny. Alright, uh, then the author quotes some uh, lines of poetry uh, that uh, person talks about Qadr. The slave is disgruntled, but Allah has preordained. Sometimes uh, the Qadr is in our favor, and sometimes it's not, as, as the hadith mentions. We believe in the Qadr, the good of it, and also the bad of it. So the slave is disgruntled, but Allah has preordained. Time changes all, man's provisions are decreed. All good lies in what our Creator has chosen. To try to follow something else is blameworthy and a misfortune. And this is what we call uh, in Arabic al-rida bil qadr that we are pleased with Allah's decree. Sometimes things happen, and it might feel terrible, but we have to force ourselves to accept it and be pleased with what Allah, uh, whatever Allah has uh, decreed for us. So this is the fifth uh, pillar or the fifth branch of iman, al iman bil qadr, the good and the bad of it is from Allah. All right, moving on to. السادس من شعب الإيمان الإيمان باليوم الآخر بقوله تعالى قاتل الذين لا يؤمنون بالله ولا باليوم الآخر and then he brings some statements from Al Halimi and others. Allah says fight those who do not believe in Allah and the last day. This verse of course is has a context. It's not meant to be taken generally that we just fight the kuffar whenever we see them. This is in the context of battlefield. In the battlefield, all right. So no one should misunderstand the verse. Fight those who do not believe in Allah and what uh, the main part of quoting this verse is the last part and the last day and the last day so this is the uh, sixth branch of iman now the bra this branch of iman if you look at uh, ahead number six iman in the last day and if you look at number seven iman in the resurrection after death 
And number eight, Iman in the gathering of mankind to the standing after the resurrection from their graves. Those three things, we can actually combine them in one, right? And this is how it was in the hadith of Jirbil. In the hadith of Jirbil, he said, All right, the, the last day. In the hadith of Jirbil, uh, Rasulullah SAW says in, uh, about Iman that it is believing in the last day. He didn't mention all these other things, but they are included. But here in the book, the author uh, separates them. He says, belief in the last day, and then belief in the resurrection after death, and belief in the gathering of mankind to the standing after the resurrection from the graves. Why did he separate them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes separates them as well in the, in the Quran and, and in the Rasulullah in the hadith, as we will see. Sometimes Allah mentions them together, just belief in the last day in general, and sometimes he singles out believing in resurrection or believing in the gathering and standing. So Allah singles them out sometimes. And also possibly because sometimes a person, it's possible that a person, uh, they might believe in some aspects of uh, the last day, but not all. For example, a person might believe that uh, the world will come to an end, right? A person might say that I believe the world is gonna come to an end, but I don't believe in resurrection after death. I don't believe that once the world ends, that people are going to be resurrected and come back to life. So if they believe that, then their iman in the last day is incomplete, right? Or a person might believe, I believe that the world is going to come to an end. And I believe that people are going to be resurrected. But I don't believe in something called a standing in front of Allah or a hisab, a call, calling to account. So it's possible that people might have belief in some aspects of the last day, but not all of it. So this is possibly why he separates them to indicate that it's not enough to just believe that there's a last day. And it's not enough just to believe that everybody's going to be re re resurrected and brought back to life after. And it's not, it's not enough to believe just those two. You also have to believe that there is a standing, that there's an account, uh, that there's paradise and there's hellfire. So he separates them to indicate that, to let people know that Iman in the last day is not just believing that the world will end, but it's also involved believing in resurrection. Believe in questioning, believe in the scales and everything else that comes with it. Uh, so he quotes the verse, Fight those who do not believe in Allah and the last day. Uh, regarding this verse, Halimi says, this means to believe that the days of this world shall come to an end. And that every day that passes uses up some of the remaining span. In addition to confess that there is, that there shall be an end obliges us to confess that there has been a beginning. So if you believe that there is an end, automatically you already also believe that there's a beginning as well. If you believe that there's a last day, then you also believe there's a, there's a first day. Uh, since that, that which is without a beginning, which is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cannot pass away or change. So once we believe in the last day, we also believe in a first day. Why is it called the last day? Anyone? Why is it called the last day? Why is it called the last day? Okay. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. The, the, the earth is going to be changed. It's going to be completely different afterwards. So this is the last day of this life. After that, Qiyamah begins. Uh, and that's, that's completely different. So this is, it's called Al-Yawm uh, Al-Akhir. Uh, then he mentions uh, hadith. It is narrated that in the Sahihain by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, that, the, that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, by him in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, the hour shall surely come. The hour will be established so suddenly that two persons spreading a garment between them will not be able to finish their bargain, nor will they be able to fold it up. The hour will be established so suddenly while a man is lifting the milk from his she-camel. However, he will not be able to raise it to his mouth to drink it in time. In other words, when the hour comes, it's going to come so suddenly, people will not expect it. People will be in the middle of transactions, and the hour is going to come, and the world ends just like that. A person is going to be lifting a cup to, to drink some milk. Before that cup even reaches his lips, the hour has come, the world has ended. So it's going to come very suddenly. And the people who it comes on will be, uh, as comes in other hadith, they will be shirar uh, al the worst of creation. There will be no more believers at that time. When the hour comes, the people who it comes on will be disbelievers. So what happened to all the believers? 
what happened to all the believers. Anyone? The hour will come on disbelievers. And not only disbelievers, but the worst of disbelievers. But what happened to all the believers? Where did they go? Huh? Good. So they will already have been taken. How? Good, right? A breeze. The hadith mentions that a breeze, a, a cool breeze will come and will take the souls of all the believers. And after that, only disbelievers will remain. And they will be the worst disbelievers ever. And upon them, the hour will come. And they will be in a state of complete oblivion and, and, and delusion. And they, will, they won't expect it at all. <clears throat> so this is all part of believing in the last day. All right, moving on. As-sabi' min shu'ab al-iman, al-iman bil ba'ath, ba'ad al-mawt. Li qawlihi ta'ala, za'ma al-ladhina kafaru allan yub'athu, qul bala wa rabbi latub'athun. And also the verse, قُلِ اللَّهُ يُحْيِيكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ ثُمَّ يَجْمَعُكُمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامِةِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ He brings the verse, uh, the, the disbelievers, as you mentioned, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes singles out uh, resurrection, right? This is why the, the authors also single it out. Because in this verse, Allah singles out. The disbelievers claim that they will not be resurrected. Say, by my Lord, you shall sh most surely be resurrected. And he says, say Allah gives you life, then gives you death, and then and shall then gather you together on the day of resurrection in which there is no doubt. Uh, so this is belief in al-ba'ath. The, the Arabic term for resurrection is called al-ba'ath. Al-ba'ath. And one of the names of Yawm al-Qiyamah, the day of, the day of judgment, is called Yawm al-ba'ath. The day of resurrection. Now, the uh, disbelievers uh, at the time of Rasulullah right? They, they found it very hard, uh, far-fetched, to believe that people can be raised back to life. And they used to say this, uh, who's going to, man yuhil wa hiya rameem. Who's going to bring the bones back together after they've become dust? They, had, they found this very hard to believe. Right? Very hard to believe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to them in the Quran. He says to them, قُلْ يُحْيِيهَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا وَأَوَّلَ مَرَى Right? The one who raised it up the first time, one created the first time, he is able to do it again. Right? Because which is more difficult? to recreate something already created or to create something from scratch. Right? Obviously, creating something from scratch is more difficult than recreating. So when we say resurrection, it's recreating. Allah is only recreating what He has already created. And this is, in our terms, more difficult than creating something from, from scratch. So Allah says, the one who created the first time, He is the one who is able to resurrect and do it the second time. Uh, so. Even though we believe that there's nothing more, nothing, nothing is more difficult than Allah than something else, right? We cannot say that recreating is easier. Nothing is easier or more difficult for Allah. There's no, Allah doesn't. These things don't apply for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Him recreating everything and him doing anything else less than that, they're all the same for him. All right, Allah's power is the same for everything. There's nothing that is in, 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 in comparable in difficulty for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But Allah mentions this to show that. If you believe that Allah created the first time, then what's so hard to believe that Allah will recreate the second time when this is, in our terms, easier. This is something easier. Uh, then he mentions the hadith by Umar ibn Khattab in the Sahih. Iman is that you should believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His messengers and in the resurrection after death and in the entirety of Qadr. This is the same hadith of Jibreel in a different wording. Right? In a different wording. So the wording we had mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, it mentions... Uh, to believe in the last day. In other versions of the same hadith, it mentions min to believe in the resurrection. So there's different wording for the same hadith. Uh, but as we mentioned, this the sixth uh, branch of Iman, the seventh and the eighth, they're all part of believing in the last day. The eighth branch of Iman. Al-Iman nasi min ila al أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The eighth is Iman in the gathering of mankind to the standing after the resurrection from the graves. So the world comes to an end. After that, the trumpet is blown, then it's blown a second time. The souls are, the bodies are, are the, the soul and the body come back together and people are resurrected. They come back to life. Uh, then after that, the, uh, the people will be in wherever they have been resurrected and then they will be gathered together. There will be something called a gathering. The angels will gather people 
and they will be gathered and pushed towards one area. And the hadith is mentioned to be a specific place. Anybody know where? Where is the gathering going to be? It's going to be on earth, but a specific place on earth. Anyone know? It's the land of Sham, which is present day uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, all right, these areas, uh, Philistine. This, is, this whole area is called Sham, and this is the place of gathering. This will be what we call the Mahshar, where everybody will be gathered together. How will everybody gather, gather together? We don't know. Allahu Alam, because there are about, what, 7 billion people on earth right now? And in total, from the beginning of time until now, it's going to be what, billions. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how many, but billions of people all gathered together. Allahu Alam, how it's going to happen. But everybody's going to be gathered together in this one land. One land in Asham. And then he mentions the, uh, the verse Do they not believe that they shall be resurrected to a mighty day, a day in which all people shall stand before the Lord, Lord of the worlds? The standing is where we get the name Qiyamah. All right, Yawm al Qiyam. This is one of the maybe the most common name. Yawm al Qiyam, the day of standing. All right, because after people are resurrected, then it will be standing in front of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And then the Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu says in the Hadith of Ibn Umar, radiAllahu anhu, uh, related in Sahih Muslim, that mankind should stand before the Lord of the worlds until some people shall be submerged to the ears in their own sweat. This is a Hadith. There are other Hadith that clarify more details. But in general, the sun, Allah, uh, the, the Prophet also mentions that on the Day of Judgment, the sun will come very close, extremely close, to the point where the sun will be right above people's heads. Right now, the sun is how, how far away? How many mil millions of miles away is, is the sun? About 93 million miles away, right? So imagine the sun is coming all the way close, very close. Who, Allahu Alam, how close it will be, but it's going to be very close. And people will be sweating because of how close it is. But this sweat is not going to be according to um, you know, your body mass index or anything like that. It's going to be according to the sins. So there's some people the sweat is going to be taking uh, all the way up to their ankles. And some people the sweat is going to be up to their knees. And some people the sweat up to their chest. And then some people, as mentioned here in the hadith, they'll be submerged to their ears in their own sweat because of sins, be according to the sins. So these are all events that will happen on the Day of Judgment. Uh, after that, to believe that the iman, uh, that the abode and refuge of the believers is Jannah, and of the unbelievers, the fire. Right? This is also uh, part of believing in the last day. All this is belief in the last day. To believe that the world is going to come to an end. To believe that they're going to be resurrected afterwards. To believe that there's going to be a standing and everybody's going to have to stand and be questioned for their, uh, their deeds. And believe that after that standing and after that questioning, after that count, people, some people are going to go into paradise and others will go into the fire. And he quotes the verse, بَلَا مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَاطَ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارُ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدٌ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَمِنَ الصَّرِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدٌ Yes, whoever earns evil and his sin has encompassed him, those are the companions of the fire. They will, be, they will abide therein internally. But they who believe and do righteous deeds, those are the companions of Jannah. They will abide therein eternally. And in the hadith, the Prophet says in the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, related by Bukhari Muslim, when each of you dies, his place is shown to him morning and night. So this is talking about uh, in the grave. So when we die, and we're buried and we're put in the grave, then... Each morning and each night, a person is going to be shown their place. If he is to be of the, one of the people of Jannah, then it is the Jannah. A person will be shown Jannah. You'll be shown your place in Jannah while you're in the grave. And if he is to be of the people of the fire, then it is the fire. Then you'll be shown your place in the fire. And he shall be told, this is your place until Allah resurrects you unto him on the day of resurrection. So a person, after they, they pass away and they're buried in the grave, each morning, each evening, they're going to be shown, your, this is where you're going after you're resurrected. After you're resurrected, this is where your, your destination, where it will be. So people will know where they're going to be going. Uh, after that, Al-Ashru bin Shu'ab al-Iman, al-Imanu bi wujubi mahabbatillahi azza wa jalla. And by the way, all these, uh, yes. Yeah. Disbelievers, yes. Yes, disbelievers. Right, yes. Yeah, the belief of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah that 
uh, anyone who has an ounce of iman, the smallest grain of iman in their heart, will eventually enter paradise. They might have to go to some sort of punishment in the fire. So when it comes to punishment, your, you can be, uh, your, your sins can be purified in this life by way of calamities, trials, tribulations. If it doesn't, that doesn't do the job, and you still have sins after that, then punishment of the grave. Punishment of the grave. Punishment of the grave does not purify a person of their sins, then they might need to be punished in the hellfire. And then afterwards, they will eventually come out. So anyone who has Iman in their heart, even the smallest amount of Iman, will eventually come out uh, and enter uh, the paradise. Uh, but this is, of course, yeah, it's referring to the disbelievers, those who uh, they will be eternally in the, uh, the hellfire. Yeah. No, that's it. Once your life ends, the soul is taken, then repentance is finished. The, the time period for repentance is done. All right? Rep uh, repentance finishes when, not even when you die, when, when you, even before you die, but you, you see in the certainty of death come, as what happened with Pharaoh, right? When Pharaoh was drowning, he didn't die yet. He was saying, I believe, but it wasn't accepted. Once the, uh, the certainty of death comes, even if you're still alive, then repentance is no longer accepted at that time. So uh, once a person enters the grave, then the time for uh, Iman has passed. Time for Iman has passed. So the, uh, the tenth branch of Iman to believe or is to uh, have mahab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iman will be wujubi mahabatillahi azza wa jal li qawlihi ta'ala wa minin nasi man yattakhidu min duni lahi andadan yuhibbunahum ki hubbillah wa alladhina amanu ashaddu hubban lillah. Uh, he quotes the verse which is uh, among and among the people are those who take other than Allah as equals to him. They love them as they should love Allah but those who have iman are stronger in love for Allah. So there are people who believe in Allah but they also believe in partners besides Allah. And we call this peop these people bushrikun, those who commit shirk. So they believe in Allah. It's not that they, do, they disbelieve in Allah. They believe in Allah. But they also believe in these other idols and these other rivals besides Allah. And so their love is split. So they love Allah, uh, but they also love these rivals as they should love Allah. But then Allah says about the believers, but those who have iman are stronger in love for Allah because their love is only purely for Allah. There's no, there's no splitting it up. Right? There's no sharing the love. It's only directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those who have iman are stronger in love for Allah. And then he brings the hadith. Uh, it is narrated in the Sahihain by Anas ibn Malik that Rasulullah said, There are three qualities. Whoever has them will taste the sweetness of Iman. Whoever has these three qualities will taste the sweetness of Iman. The first is to love Allah and His Messenger وسلم, more than anyone else. So more than anyone else. More than your mother, more than your father, more than your children, more than your wife, anybody else. To love Allah and His Messenger more than anyone else. Number two, to love a slave of Allah. Only for the sake of Allah. You, you love your brother or you love your sister. Not because they're family. Not because you have things in common. Not because of anything else. They have some kind of benefits that they bring for you. Only for the sake of Allah. Only for the sake of Allah. Then this is a sign of pure Iman. Which is a person will taste the sweetness of Iman from that. And the third is uh, to hate returning to kufr after Allah has saved him from it. As he would hate to be thrown into a blazing fire. And he quotes some uh, lines of poetry, we'll skip those for now. Uh, and his other lines of poetry, we'll mention these at the end, uh, which is from beautiful lines of poetry uh, by a person, uh, a woman by the name of uh, Rabia. Rabia, she says, Ta'asul ilaha wa anta tuzhira hubbahu. Hada muhalun fil fi'ali badi'u. Law kana hubbuka sadiqan la ata'atahu inna al muhibba liman ahabba muti'u. Right? These are some lines of poetry about what it means to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we say that loving Allah is from the branches of Iman. What does that mean? Loving Allah necessitates obeying Him. Necessitate, necessitates obeying Him. So in these lines of poetry, uh, Rabi, she's, she's saying that you disobey Allah and you express that you love Him. This is impossible and a bizarre affair. You cannot say that you love Allah but you disobey Him. If your love is true, you would obey Him. For lovers always obey the ones they love. Right? When, you, when you love somebody, then you are more inclined to obey that person. Not obey them as in whatever they say you do, but you know they like something, you try to do what they like. And so people who have love for each other, they tend to 
do what other do what the other person likes and loves. So you cannot claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but then you disobey him. This is something that is bizarre and as she says, impossible. Al Hadi Ashar bin Shu'ab al Iman, the eleventh branch of Iman, Al Iman bi wujub al Khawfi min Allah Azza wa Jal. To to uh, the obligation to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he brings a number of verses, a number of verses, all about the same topic. Falata khafuhum wa khafuni in kuntum mu'mini. Falata khsha wa nasa wa khshawni. Wa iyaya farhabun. Wa hum min khashatihi mushfiqun. Wa yadruna na rakhbaun wa rahba wa kanu lana khashi'in. Wa yakshana rabbahum wa yakhafuna su al hisab. Wa liman khafa maqam rabbihi jannatan. Thalika liman khafa maqami wa khafa wa'id. A number of verses all revolving around the same point of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so fear them not, but fear me if you are indeed believers. So do not fear the people, but fear me. Be afraid of me only. And they from their fear of Allah are apprehensive. And the rest of the verses. And a number of verses are mentioned here, all revolving around the same point, which is that we need to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning fear Allah's punishment. And this is a necessary component of Iman, to fear Allah's punishment. Because what's going to happen if, a, if somebody doesn't have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What's going to happen if a person does not have fear of Allah? What is, it, what is that going to lead to? Hmm? Sins, right? You're going, to, you're going to do whatever you want. If you don't have any fear of punishment and fear that Allah is going to uh, hold you into account for your deeds, then a person will do whatever they want. So this is a necessary component of uh, Iman, that you have to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's narrated in the Sahihain by Adi ibn Hatim that the Prophet said, Ward off the fire, even if it only with a half a date. Even with half a date in charity, if that's, if that's what's going to keep you away from the fire, then do it. And from this hadith, we also learned that you should not ever look down on any, any good deed. Any good deed, even how small it is, never look down on, on it. Because this is the thing that, that can save you from the fire. You can do something very small, but your sincerity is very high. And this is what causes you to be safe in the fire. All right, we know the very, uh, the very famous hadith in which uh, the woman, she gave the, a thirsty dog water to drink. The, she was getting water from the well, and she saw a dog panting and be, be very thirsty. She went down, she got some water, and as a result, she was entered into paradise because of that deed. So never look down on any small deed, even if it's half a date of giving charity, because this could be something that saved you from the fire. And uh, the hadith in Bukhari by Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet said, if you knew what I know, you would laugh little and weep much. You would laugh little and weep much. What does Rasulullah know? He saw what we did not see. Right? He saw hellfire. We have not seen hellfire. We've heard about it. Right? We've read the descriptions of hellfire. But we have not seen it. And when you see something, it's not the same as hearing about it. The Arabs, have, they have a saying. The Arabs, they have a saying. That hearing about something is not the same as seeing it. When you see something, it's much different than when you hear about it. So we can hear about all the descriptions of the, the hellfire. But when you see it in front of you, as Rasulullah he saw it. He saw people being punished in the hellfire when he went up to the, uh, the, the, the journey to the heavens. He saw the people being punished. And he, and he related this to us. So what he, because what he saw, this is why he's saying this. Whom, if you knew what I knew, because he saw the, these things with his own eyes, then you would laugh a little and weep much. And then he quotes some uh, other lines of poetry, as well as a uh, statement from Umar ibn, Khatta, uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Uh, we'll skip these for now, inshallah, but whoever has the book, you can read these, or, or the PDF, uh, beneficial uh, lines of poetry, inshallah. Moving on. Al-Thani Ashar min Shu'ab al-Iman. Al-Iman bi wujub al-Raja min Allah Azza wa Jal. These are two, as they say, two wings of the bird, right? The, the bird cannot fly if it has uh, only one wing functioning, right? You cannot, the bird cannot fly if it has one wing. It needs both wings functioning. So the two wings of the believer is al-khawf wal-raja. And that's what they say, the scholars say, al-imanu bayn al-khawfi wal-raja. The iman is between uh, fear and hope, right? You have to have these two balanced out, all right? If you have no fear, you'll do whatever you want and you won't fear any punishment. But if you have no hope, then you won't do any good deeds. What, what's the point of doing anything? Allah is not going to forgive me. Allah is going to punish me. So when a person loses hope, then they're not going to do it. They're not going to have the motivation to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey Him. So you need these two things. To have fear 
and it also needs to be balanced out by, by hope. Have fear and balanced out by hope. What is the opposite of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Anyone know? What is the opposite? A person has fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the opposite? A person has no fear. Anyone know? Okay. So Arabic term we call it Al-Amnu Min Makrillah to feel safe or secure from Allah's plan. All right, so see, you have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opposite of that is to feel safe, feel that Allah is not going to punish you, feel that you can do whatever you want. It's called Al-Amnu Min Makrillah. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا يَأْمَنُوا مَكْرَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْخَاسِرُ That no one feels secure or safe from Allah's plan except for the people who are in a state of loss. All right, so this is the opposite of fear. Al-Amnu Min Makrillah. So you have fear of Allah, and then you have to avoid the opposite, which is feeling safe, feeling secure, feeling that nothing, nothing's going to happen to you. And then we have this term, al-raja, which is hope. The opposite is, what is the opposite of hope? Feeling uh, despair. Despair, despairing from the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, in the Arabic term, it's called kunut. Kunut, all right, with a thought. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهُمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Allah says, those say to my slaves who have transgressed and wronged themselves, do not despair, right? do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says in, in another verse, وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ Do not uh, lose hope in Allah's mercy. إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ then only disbelievers lose uh, hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to have this, this balance, right? You need to have this balance of hope and fear. And they should be balanced out. However, the scholars, they say that when you're healthy and strong, when you're healthy and strong, one should be slightly more than the other. Which one is that? If you're healthy, then you should make one of these a bit higher. Which one? When you're healthy. And when you're sick, and when you're close to death, you should make the other one a bit higher. So which one is which? Fear for the healthy, right? So when you're healthy, you should let that side of fear be a little bit higher, all right? And when you are sick, or when you're close to death, then let the side of hope be a bit higher, all right? So they should be generally equal, but when you're healthy, make that side of fear a bit higher. So that, that will make you more fearful and make, make you more uh, obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you are you know, close to death, sick, then you make that side of hope a bit higher. Because at this time, the actions, you're not going to be able to do as many actions as you want. So you're, you know, you're more now relying on Allah's mercy at this point. So you want to make that, that side of hope higher. Uh, and we have the verses. يَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَافُونَ عَذَابَ إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّكَ كَانَ مَحْذُورَ A few other verses. We're not going to read all of them for uh, lack of time. Uh, but they all revolve around this point of uh, having hope and uh, not, losing, uh, not losing hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, they hope for His mercy and fear His punishment. Indeed, the mercy of Allah is near to the, the doers of good. Say, O my servants who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. It is indeed He who, has, who is the forgiving, the merciful. Uh, then we have this verse, very important verse. Indeed, Allah does not forgive as, uh, association with Him, but He forgives what is less than that for who, whom, whoever He wills. So Allah forgives any sin except for shirk. This is the one sin that is unforgivable, which is the sin of associating partners with Him. Every other sin Allah forgives except for shirk. Now, we say that Allah does not forgive shirk, right? But if a person repents from shirk in this life, is it accepted? Yes. So what does this verse mean? Allah does not forgive association with Him. Hmm? Right, before you die. All right, after you die, Allah does not forgive shirk. If you, if you repent from shirk before, then it is forgiven. All right, so Allah forgives everything else except for shirk. That means, what this means is that if a person dies and they didn't make tawbah, then Allah can forgive everything else except for shirk. Right? Allah can forgive anything else if you die with, with that, without tawbah, except for shirk. So if a person dies and they have a lot of sins, we say that this person is under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huwa tahta mashi'atillah. He is under Allah's will and discretion. Insha'a azabahu aw insha'a ghafaradahu. 
if Allah wills, he can forgive. And if Allah wills, he can uh, punish. So if a person dies and they have sins, Allah can forgive them if he wants. But if a person dies without, without uh, repenting of shirk, then this will not be accepted. Right. Yes. Yeah. Th that hadith is referring to uh, a minor shirk. All right, the minor shirk, which is uh, showing off, doing your deeds for other than Allah. All right, praying so, so people can see you. All right, the hadith is referring to minor shirk, and that's not the same as major shirk. That can be forgiven. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. As I said, that it's called minor. It's, it's, it's called shirk, but it's the minor shirk. It's like it's more like a major sin. So it falls under that category of major sins or sins in general, right? Which a which a person can still be forgiven by Allah, if Allah wills, or if Allah wills, He can punish him. But if you commit major shirk, the major shirk, just that one, there's no there's no um, what you call it. There's no nobody you'll know. Right? That that's not hidden. Right? That's not hidden. So the major shirk, if a person dies then, and, they, and they did not repent, then that will not be forgiven. Anything else can be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he wills. And if he wills, he can punish as well if he wants. Uh, it is narrated that in the Sahihain by Abu Hurairah, عنه, that the Prophet said, we uh, were the believers only to know what punishment Allah has in store. None would hope for his Jannah. And were the unbelievers to know what a mercy Allah has in store, none would despair of his Jannah. And uh, Sahih Muslim by Abu Hurairah and narrated by Abu Hurairah عنه, that the Prophet said, None should die without thinking well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one should, a person should die except that they, they believe that Allah is going to forgive me. No one should lose hope. Right? Especially, as we said, especially when a person is on their deathbed, when they're sick. This is the time where you raise that level of hope even higher. So no one should die and they think, they're, they have this feeling that Allah is not going to forgive me. Allah is going to punish me. This is... Uh, this is something that should be avoided, right? So you should always have that balance out of hope and also fear, hope and fear. And uh, the Hadith Qudsi, I am as my slave thinks of me, and I am with him whenever he remembers me. So if you think that Allah is going to punish you, then Allah might punish you, right? But if you believe that Allah is merciful, Allah is going to forgive me, then this is how you should be, and inshallah, Allah will be as you think of him. Uh, moving on to الثالث عشر من شعب الإيمان I think we'll try to do this one and the one after inshallah and then end Iman um, that one must have tawakkul reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and upon Allah the believer should rely sufficient for, Allah, for us is Allah and he is the best disposer of affairs and a number of other verses and then we have the hadith in the Sahihain by Ibn Abbas concerning uh, the Sahaba's inquiry about 70,000 who would enter Jannah without reckoning so there's 70,000 people who will enter Jannah, no reckoning, no questioning, nothing. And they have four characteristics. They are those who do not resort to cauterization. Cauterization, is, this is a type of uh, treatment that people used to do. When they would have a wound, they would take a, uh, a sharp uh, or a metal and they would burn it and then they would put it on the wound. Right? It's called cauterization. And this is allowed, but it is also something that's very painful. And because it causes extreme pain, uh, it, it's dislike to use this type of uh, of this type of uh, treatment for for treating wounds, and those who use charms and divination, and in the last part, and they relied on their Lord instead. Those people who have these four characteristics, then they will be amongst the seventy thousand will enter paradise without any reckoning. Uh, so this is uh, what we call tawakkul, which is relying on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this does not mean that you sit down and do nothing. Some people have a misunderstanding of what is tawakkul. Uh, which is relying on Allah means that I rely on Allah and I sit down and I expect that things are going to come to me. So we're supposed to clarify that tawakkul is not sitting around doing nothing, but rather tawakkul goes hand in hand with also taking the means. And this is why we have the hadith where Rasulullah says, it is better that one of you should take a rope and go to the mountains and return with a load of firewood on his back, which he then sells to become self-sufficient instead of begging from others who may give something to him or may not. Right, so uh, tawakkul, relying on Allah, it doesn't mean that you sit back and relax and do nothing, but it is rather that you go out and you earn your livelihood. Even if you have to go to the mountains and drag your own firewood, it's better than you, 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 you ask people 
and then you'll be subject to them telling you no. Right? You might ask somebody and they'll tell you no, maybe come another day. And this is a type of disgrace for a person to do that. So it's better for you to hold your head high and go and bring your own firewood and be self-sufficient rather than uh, having to uh, rely on people. And in the, in the hadith, the best food anyone can eat is that which is earned by one's hands. Right? What you earn with your own hands instead of begging people and taking from other people. Dawood used to eat only from the money which he had himself uh, earned. And a number of other statements are mentioned. We'll skip these inshallah for, for now. And I think we'll end with that uh, for today. Ending at the uh, 13th branch of Iman. Iman uh, uh, having tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so we'll end with that. Jazakumullah khairan for everyone for attending. Uh, we'll end with some questions. So if you have any questions, we'll take those now inshallah. Yes. There's different layers of qadr. So we have the, the qadr that is written on the, the, the master book, which is the lawh al mahfud. Right? That qadr cannot be changed. And then there is qadr that goes from year to year. So things that are destined for this year are written, or it's going to happen next year. These can be changed with dua. Right? These can be changed with dua. But the qadr that is in the, in the master book, right? which is which, what the pen wrote, that cannot be changed. That is permanent. But then there's the, there is the qadr of uh, things that will happen in the next year, right? So there's, things, there's another book that will be written of things that will happen from year to year. This can be changed depending on certain circumstances like, like dua, right? So that can be changed. But the, the, the qadr that is in the, uh, in the lawh al-mahfuz, the preserved tablet which has written, everything written, that cannot be changed at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, even your own self. Yeah, and there's a hadith on that as well, uh, where Rasulullah says that none of you has have belief, no, you believe until you love. Uh, referring to Rasulullah, not until you love me more than you love your your father and your child and nas ajma'in. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, he came to Rasulullah and he said that I love you more than uh, my, 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 my father, my children, everybody else except for myself. And then Rasulullah said to him that you haven't got it yet. You haven't, you haven't got that full peak of Iman yet. And then later on he came back and he said, I love you more than any, everyone, including myself. And then Rasulullah said that now you have attained that the peak of Iman. All right? So even more than yourself, everyone else, including yourself. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. So in that uh, incident we mentioned, people were, de were denying divine decree. So they were saying that Allah does not know things are going to happen until they happen. So they were denying this concept. And so uh, Ibn Umar told them that even if you were to spend in gold the weight of Uhud, it will not be accepted from you until you believe in Qadr because it's a pillar of Iman. All right? So there are people who denied a Qadr because they, they felt that uh, it contradicts free will. Right? So there's people who think that if Allah knows everything that's going to happen, that means that I'm forced to do everything. And so because they feel that this contradicts free will, so they deny Qadr. And then you have another stream. People say they, 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 they denied free will. And they said that we are being forced to do everything. Right? We are forced to do everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is controlling us just like you know, the, uh, the, the feather that goes in the sky and the wind just push it, pushes it wherever it goes. They say that that's how we are. But uh, the people of Sunnah, Ahl Sunnah, we be, we're in the middle. We believe, we affirm that Allah knows everything and decrees everything. But we also have free will. Right? We also have free will. 
and we also are responsible for our choices. So we, we acknowledge and we affirm uh, both, both together, without con The Khawarij, their, you know, their, their main problem was that they believe that sins, we talk about sins, right? They believe that sins, major sins, take you out of Islam. Right? So we said that if a person dies, right, if you die and you have major sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive that. Right? The Khawarij said that if you commit a major sin, you're a disbeliever. You have, you have left Islam. Once you commit a major sin, you've left Islam. And so they went astray with that. They, they believe that uh, sins, specifically major sins, they take you out of Islam. And if a person dies with a major sin, then they're destined for the hellfire. Right. So that's the, that's the Khawarij. All right, any other questions? All right, so Jazakum uh, Khairan, we'll uh, wrap up with that. Subhanak wa bihamdik, nashadun la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa ritubu ilayh. Wa al-asul min sanayati khusr illa dina amma'ani salihat wa tuwasubu al-haqqi wa tuwasubu al-sawf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.